Welcome back guys, it's Israel. So recently at work, we had to create a new API and we knew that we'd have to use some type of mapper. And someone recommended to me to use auto mapper. And I immediately said, yeah, we're not, we're not doing that. It's old, it's hard to read. And I figured in 2025, there has to be a more modern and faster mapper out there that I can use in my .NET application. So here I am to recommend to you guys going forward that you guys need to use the best mapper I've ever used in .NET. And that is Mapperly. So let me tell you a little bit about it and then show you how it works. But quickly, I want to give a shout out to all my channel members. If you want to see your name here, as well as get access to all the code from all my videos, click the link in the description or the join button on my profile. But now on to Mapperly. So why use Mapperly? Well, Mapperly generates its mapping code at compile time and does not use reflection during runtime to actually create its code for mapping, making it much faster than a lot of the other traditional mappers out there, specifically auto mapper. Since the mapping code is generated at compile time, it catches errors earlier in the process. It's very minimal at runtime since it's really all done at compile time, easy to use and customizable as well. And I know some of you might have a little bit of confusion with the word reflection. Uh, I know I sometimes have trouble with these like terminologies, right? So how does Mapperly work at compile time versus let's say auto mapper or another mapper that works using reflection at runtime? Well, this is kind of one good example that I found. And it's like, let's say you go to a restaurant and in the reflection mapper case, uh, you go to a restaurant, you order. Uh, you place your order, the order goes to the chef. The chef then has to go and figure out what is the recipe? How do I map these things now? But you're right now, when the order is happening, when the application is running, you have to figure out what you're gonna do and then you create the, the dish and send it out to the person. Map the thing and send it to the, the person requesting it. Versus in a compile time mapper, what happens is you place that order and the chef already has the recipes laid out in front of them and they already know how to create this because they prepped everything that they needed beforehand, before they opened the restaurant. They already have everything ready to go to create your dish faster. And that's how a compiled time mapper works. So I hope that example helps kind of describe the difference between a compiled time mapper and a runtime mapper. But now onto the code and how to use Mapperly. All right, guys, so we are now at the project. This is a .NET 9 API. Let me just show you guys what we have here right before we add in Mapperly. So it is just an API that uses the same database that I've used for a handful of videos, which is just a Pokemon data that I'm storing in my local SQL server. So while this is booting up, let me show you guys the database that I'm using. So it's just going to have these few tables with some Pokemon that I like. Uh, the region that they're from, if you guys have played Pokemon, they're from different regions and they have different types. And then we just have a few Pokemon in here. So that's all that is. And then I just have a get, a create, edit, and delete uh, endpoints in here. And we are going to be using this Pokey API. So essentially, we're just going to be retrieving data from here. And then using Mapperly, we're going to map it into the objects that we want for our database. Uh, and we're going to be hitting the endpoint for Rampardos. If you guys have been playing TCG Pocket, Rampardos is pretty popular and it's the one that I've been using a lot. So that that was the inspiration for using Rampardo. So this is gonna be pokeyapi.co and then this is gonna be the endpoint right here. And that's what we're gonna be using just in case you guys are confused. And then, so this is what our API looks like. We are using Scalar as well. Uh, we are not using Swagger anymore. And if you guys wanna learn more about why I don't use Swagger anymore and I use Scalar, uh, check out the video up here somewhere. Uh, so we have our endpoints right here. So again, get, create, edit, delete, and then we have uh, some very basic models in here. So let's close this and let's start installing Mapperly. So the first thing you might have to do, um, and this is something that you just do before, you know, you end up starting to do mapping, is you might need to get all your classes for whatever endpoint you're receiving data from. So I already went ahead and did that uh, for the Pokey API. So moving ahead, let's get the NuGet package for Mapperly installed. So the package you guys need to install is called reoak, something like that, Mapperly. So it's gonna be this one right here. So we're gonna go ahead and install that one. And this is the only NuGet package that we're actually gonna need to make Mapperly work. So we're good from here. And so now, since we're gonna be getting our information from that pokeyapi.co, we're gonna need an HTTP client. So let's go ahead and set that up. So I'm gonna go to my program.cs and ignore some of this other code that I used uh, for some of my other videos, but we're going to go right here 
and we're going to add this HTTP client, Pokemon client, and then it's going to be hitting the endpoint for the Pokey API. And so now that we have the HTTP client, let's go ahead and create our mapper. So we're going to go over here and we're going to do add. We're going to do new folder and we're going to call this mapper. And then inside of here, we're going to create our Pokemon mapper. So we're going to add new item and we're going to call this Pokemon mapper. So in here is where we're going to do all the mapperly mapping. So we're going to declare basically that we want to take the Pokey API Pokemon object that we get and we want to turn it into our Pokemon object for our database. And let me show you guys the Pokemon uh, table. So in there, we're just going to have a Pokemon ID, a name, a type ID, Pokedex number, and region ID. Very simple table. And obviously type ID is going to point to our type table and region ID points to our region table. So as you guys can see here, it's just going to be ints and then the number in the Pokedex that they are, their name, and then a Pokemon ID that gets created, you know, when you add a new record into the database. So now let's go ahead and create our mapper. And this is going to be the code for the Pokemon mapper. So in here, you need to put this mapper attribute right here. That's how Mapperly knows that we're going to be using this class as a mapping class. And then we are going to have these map properties right here. This is essentially saying we want from the Pokey API uh, object, the name field is going to go into our name. Then we're going to have ID is going to go into Pokedex number. And then type is going to go into type ID and types is going to go into region ID. Uh, so these first two are pretty self-explanatory. We wouldn't need these if, uh, you know, Pokedex number was Pokedex number or if ID was ID in ours. So if we had this, we could just have a mapping function that we call, and then these would just get automatically kind of uh, moved across because they have the same name. But because of the fact that these are different, then all you have to do is this map property right here, and then say name of ID is gonna go to name of Pokedex number. And then that's how the ID goes to the Pokedex number because that's the field in the Pokey API versus, you know, in my database. So if I go here and let's submit, we can see if we go through here, our ID, this is the Pokedex number that I'm looking for. And obviously name is Rampardos. So if we go here, those are the two fields I want to map here. And now you might say, okay, well, how does mapping work if, you know, I have a nested object or an object that maybe is a different type or something like that. Mapperly is all about the data types. So let's say right here types and we want to get the type ID, which is going to point to some type of type in our database. Well, if we go down here, we see that types is a list and inside of there, we need rock. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of cheating. I know that rock is ID 13 in my database. So if we go to our types, we can go in here. We see that rock is 13. So I'm just going to cheat a little bit um, and go ahead from here. So if let's say our type here is an object, and then in here we have, this is just going to be an int. So how can we directly map these? Well, we're going to need a little function and that little function is going to be defined down here. So if you need to do a function, there's two ways of doing this. And this is why I have two of these. Uh, even though types and region ID wouldn't make sense, it's just to show you guys the extra functionality that in case you need some extra logic to convert something to something else, you can do it in this way. So there's two different ways. You can, in fact, do something like this. So let's just say this wasn't here. You would declare a map a map property, and let's say this is type of uh, Pokemon API dot type. So this is an object versus type ID is an int. So if I wanted to do that, I just need to create a mapping function in here that has a type of the type class, and then it returns an int. And then Mapperly will know whenever it creates its code at compile time that we need for this field of type ID to use this one. And I'll show you once we actually run the application, uh, the generated code as well, because it's very easy to find and it looks very straightforward uh, for anyone that knows how to program. Um, but let's say we wanted to specify, we want to use this mapping function. We don't want Mapperly to decide what mapping function to use. Well, you can use this use right here, name of map type two. So it would, instead of using the default, which we defined here. So for any type object that is turned into an int, this is the default that we're going to use. 
Um, but instead here we're defining map type two. So a lot of times, especially with the work project that I had to do where I found myself needing to use a lot of these little logic functions were for dates. Uh, the dates in the database that we were getting were string dates and we needed to turn them into date only or date time dates. And with that, I needed to actually have some extra logic to do that conversion because we all know that date and date times are very tricky to work with. Uh, and that's really where I found myself needing to add in this extra little logic and Mapperly made it very easy for me to do as well as this to me is just very easy to read. So this is what we have here. So here you can just set the default for those types. Uh, and if you wanted to call a specific function, you would just do something like this. But think of Mapperly, it always uses data types. So that's where it's going to look to for everything. So if, if we have conflicting uh, types that don't declare this right here, like let's just say this was gone. Oh my goodness. Let's just say this was gone right here and we had two different methods. Well, it would just pick one. It wouldn't, if, if this wasn't here and this wasn't here, the data types, it would see, oh, we have two of these. I'm just going to pick one. So maybe you're not going to get the result that you want. So I just want you guys to be aware of that. But these are some of the common things that I ran into when using Mapperly, which is essentially I might need to transform something and use some extra logic as well as just the regular mapping. And I just want to show you guys this functionality because I think this is functionality that you will actually use in the real world when actually mapping. Uh, and I think this is the very useful stuff. But now let's actually do the other part of the implementation to actually use this mapper. So in our Pokemon controller, we're going to need to have an endpoint for this. So what we're going to have to do is do something like this. I'm going to create this post endpoint here. And it's going to be create from Poke API data. We need to have this client factory. So let's go ahead and add that in. I'm going to go up here to the top. We're going to add this in. And then we need to add this client factory in. And then what else are we going to need? I think we need to add this in here, our constructor. And I think we're good here. So this is the URL that we're going to be hitting just in case anyone wants to see it again. So it's this pokeapi.co backslash API v2 Pokemon and Rampardos to get Rampardos's information. So now that we did uh, the HTTP client factory at the top, let's go back to our create from Pokemon API data. And let me walk you guys through this. So first line, we create our client factory. So we create our Pokemon client. Uh, we then append to our URL that we did in the program.cs right here. We are appending Pokemon Rampardos. We make sure that we uh, get a successful status code from the API. And then we deserialize into our Pokemon API uh, endpoint object. So what's in there? All of this stuff. So this is everything that the Poke API is giving us. And all these models and all of this are what I had shown at the beginning, which are in here. Um, so let me go back here. We get this object and now we're doing the mapper release stuff. So the first thing you do is you call new Pokemon mapper. So obviously Pokemon mapper is what we did here. Then you just pass in the object that you're going to map to the object that we want. So we want the Pokemon class object, which is this one, which just has everything that was in the database. So we want to map the Poke, Poke API object to this object. So all you do is you pass that in and then it spits out the mapped object that we want. And then you use that object, pass it into our create Pokemon endpoint, and it successfully should create the Pokemon that we want for our SQL database. So now that we have all of the code that we need, let's step through here and make sure that everything works. And I'll show you guys what the Mapperly code uh, that it creates at compile time looks like as well. But quickly, guys, if you guys are finding this video helpful, please drop a like on this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of the other amazing content that I have for you guys. So now I'm going to put a breakpoint right here at var mapper. And let's run this API and let's see what happens. So we have our create from Pokemon uh, API data right here. So we're actually going to test that request. Let me change this to 4430 because that's the proper one. And now let's send. So we hit our breakpoint. So we are now in the create from Pokey API data uh, endpoint. So let's see if we got a successful response from the Pokey API. In here, we see that we did in fact get the information that we wanted. So we got that whole reply. And in here, we got the Pokedex number, so 409, the name Rampardos, and then we can see uh, its stats, its type. So its type in here is going to be rock. So we have the information that we want. So now let's see if everything gets mapped correctly. So I'm gonna, actually going to go to the Pokemapper, and I'm going to put a breakpoint here just so that we can see when it actually uses this. So the way this should work is that when we get to mapping type ID, 
it should look at this one. And then since these are the exact same data types, it should use the default for region ID. So it should go to here because we said this one's the default. So on default, use this one. But then when you're going to do your mappings, we specified to use this one. And then these just map. And let's see if that continues to work. So let's step through here. So now we are at the point that we've created our mapper. And now we're actually going to do the mapping. So we can see that we've already finished these. And now we are at this part where it went ahead and it called this. So it passed in the type name. So we can see that in here, it's the rock that I just showed you. And it's just going to return to 13. And now, now, this is the cool part. We can see the actual compiled code that Mapperly has created. So we can see here that it's passing in our object. So this is what we were seeing right here, is that we are passing in our object. But then we see the mapping. So if you guys were to manually map it, right, it would look something like this. So you're mapping the name to name. Uh, you're mapping the type ID, or you're mapping the type to type ID. Uh, this ID to Pokedex number, and you are calling these functions to do the mapping as well. And you're calling these functions to return the proper values to type ID and region ID, and then you just return the target. So this is the code actually generated by Mapperly, which is that recipe that the chef already has uh, when your application is running. So this is what it actually looks like. So we're stepping through, and now we got to region ID when it's doing that mapping. So it's at this point right here where it passes in the types to the map type function. And then in here, we see that now it's using the default because we didn't specify. So this is, I think, a very good way that if you have different fields that you need to just add a little bit more logic to, this is an easy way that you can control what Mapperly knows to call and what to do if you need to do some extra logic on something. So stepping through here, we should be able to now return our target. And we should see that we have a mapped Pokemon. So we now see we have its name, its Pokedex number, uh, a region ID, uh, and then a type ID. So what we could do is I could go back here. We can set this to a valid uh, region ID here. And then we can rerun this again. And now we can see if we actually create a valid uh, Pokemon. So stepping through, I'm just going to really quickly test, request... And let's just go all the way through. We're back at our endpoint, and I'm just going to press. So all this stuff is good. Now we clicked all the way through. I didn't see any errors. So let's go back to our Pokemon table. And now we refresh, and we see that we have Rampardos in our database with all the information that we got when we did the mapping. So that is everything you guys need to do to add Mapperly to your .NET APIs. I highly recommend it in 2025. I think it's super easy to use, super readable, super fast, as well as it does give you the ability to customize if some of your data types and things that you have to map are a little bit more complicated. It clearly gives you the ability as I just showed you guys. So highly recommend Mapperly to anyone that's looking for a mapper nowadays uh, to use in their .NET application. And if you guys want to learn a little bit more about .NET APIs and more things that you can do, specifically security or authentication, check out these videos right here.